Well, it's good to have everybody here this morning, <clears throat> holiday weekend. Our members are out of town and visitors are here, so <laughs> uh, it's good to have everybody that is here, here, and if you're watching online, we're, it's more coming in here, um, we're in Acts chapter 17 this morning. One of the more interesting chapters, I think, in the entire New Testament. And uh, we'll see if we can get through that this morning and have a good discussion about that. Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke are in the midst of the second uh, missionary journey, as it's commonly referred to. It takes Paul over a course of almost 3,000 miles over a three to four year period of time. <laughs> and... Uh, he runs into a whole spectrum of people of varying backgrounds, varying cultures, varying religious beliefs, much like we do today. And I think it's interesting to look at the different type of folks that Paul uh, met up with and how he presented the gospel. Uh, Paul's missionary journeys are very, really very instructive uh, as far as teaching us how to teach the gospel today. Because Paul used the approach of identifying with the individual and customizing his presentation to where that individual was coming from. He didn't have a set lecture that he gave to everybody, but um, he used uh, the knowledge that the person already had and then tried to shape that and enlighten that person um, with uh, the gospel message. So if you have your Bible there, if you don't have one, there should be one in the back of the pew in front of you, which is a, we have a New King James translation. And uh, we'll be looking at chapter 17 as we get started here this morning. Before we start, Ron, would you lead us in prayer? Our dear friend, gracious Heavenly Father, who are in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity you've allowed us that we might have here to study your word and to learn more perfectly your will for us. Father, we ask that you help us to clear our minds of any misconceptions or predispositions we may have, that we can read your word or what it says and accept all of its wisdom. We ask, Father, that you help us to that end, that you help us to gain much good from our study, and that we will be able to apply it in our own lives, that we might be found faithful to you. We ask, Father, that you forgive us our sins. We stand in prayer. Amen. <clears throat> Well, we'll begin it in uh, chapter 17. One thing I'd like for you to keep in mind, uh, just kind of an interesting observation as we go through this chapter, who wrote the book of Luke? Who wrote the book of Acts? <laughs> as Paul begins a secondary second missionary journey, uh, Luke is in the company. If you turn over to the 16th chapter of the book of Acts in verse 13, as Paul and his company leave Troas, they reach the city of Philippi. We talked about this last week. And they come down to the riverside and they find Lydia there. I don't know if you paid much attention to it as you read the verse, but Look at the first sentence in verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, what? We went out of the city to the riverside. So when Paul approached Lydia and these ladies and sat down to talk with them, Luke was right there hearing the conversation and recording 
in real time what happened. Now, if you turn over to the 17th chapter and the first verse, what we're going to talk about this morning, we've already had the story of the Paul's imprisonment at Philippi, his liberation from prison by the earthquake, the conversion of the Philippian jailer, um, his interaction with the magistrates there who had falsely thrown him, a Roman citizen, into prison without due process, uh, and Paul's very clever way of forcing the magistrates to come in person and let him out of jail rather than just sending some underling to do the job because they were uh, actually fearful of what he might do legally against them when it says they feared when they heard that they were Romans in verse 38, chapter 16. Got out of prison, they went to Lydia's house and uh, spent some time there and then departed. But look how chapter 17 begins. Now when... Where's Luke? <laughs> when Paul and his company left Philippi and headed south, ultimately to Thessalonica and then Berea and then Paul on down to Athens and Corinth, Luke stayed behind in Philippi. Okay, We don't find Luke again until chapter 20, and verse 5. And that's actually on the third missionary journey. So Paul has left Luke in Philippi. He completes the second missionary journey, returns to uh, Antioch, and begins the third missionary journey um, in chapter 18, verse 23, and doesn't meet up with Luke again until he passes back into Macedonia to the city of Philippi. And as a result, uh, Luke rejoins the, the party in verse 5. And Luke then was in the party leaving Philippi, going to Troas, and in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them and, and ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. Luke was in that company. So it's interesting, as you read the book of Acts, look the changes between us and we and they, and you can tell when Luke's with Paul and when he's not. That's just kind of an interesting observation as you go through the the book. Okay, any thoughts or comments, questions? Anybody? Well, let's look at the first nine verses of chapter 17. <clears throat> Anyone want to volunteer to read those? <laughs> Okay, so as we mentioned before, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke are in this 
traveling company. And of course, Paul's going to pick up some additional folks as he goes along because his brethren provided relief to the brethren back in Judea. They oftentimes set um, another individual, which we'll read some of their names, I believe, in the next chapter, um, to verify that the offering was getting back to the uh, church in Jerusalem for distribution to the needy saints there. So anyway, um, well, my clicker doesn't want to work this morning. So they're up here in um, Philippi, and they're next going to come through Amphipolis, which we don't really, uh, Amphipolis rather, don't read of any preaching there, but they were there in Apollonia, and then they come down to Thessalonica, and then they'll next go to Berea. So they're here at Thessalonica, and as Paul's custom was, where did he go first? The synagogue. Why did he go there? That's where people were worshiping God. And that's where he would find a, an audience to present the gospel to. And it says he was there for three Sabbath days, three weeks, teaching about Christ. And what response did he get? Well, that's kind of the way things go today, isn't it? <laughs> so some of the Jews believed. How about the Greeks? How did they respond? A large oh, a large number of Greeks believed. How about the chief women of the city? Joseph. What? Joseph. How many of the women responded? Not a few. I like the King James way of describing that better than the sterile way that the New American Standard translators translate. <laughs> not a few. What does not a few mean? A lot, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so here, now think about this just a minute. You're the Apostle Paul, and you're going into a synagogue of the Jews, people who, whose ancestors for centuries have worshiped the God of heaven. And you preach the gospel, showing them that Jesus has fulfilled all of these prophecies that they've been, their ancestors have told them about, they've been recorded in scrolls, they've read about, they read in the synagogue every week. And who ends up receiving the word, by and large? The Greeks. <laughs> Okay, lesson for today. What does that tell us? Tell me, what, what, what is the moral of that story? <laughs> okay, that's good. What did the Greeks not have that was to their advantage that the Jews had? Because they had that concept, what what did that cause them to do? Or what do we call that thought process? Or something that prejudicial. Yeah, prejudicial. They had Jews had a certain amount of prejudice already built up in their mind that the Greeks didn't have, from this standpoint at least. We'll see that again when Paul gets to Athens, which is another interesting story. 
But you have all these Greeks that respond, okay, so then what happens? What do the disbelieving Jews decide they're going to do? Run them out of town. Because they're obviously teaching false doctrine in their minds, right? <coughs> Exactly. And notice the terminology that they that they use in verse six. These guys are spreading this these tall tales, and they have a reputation that's following them. And what's their reputation? What are they doing to the world? Yeah, turning it upside down. Every place they go, there's nothing but turmoil takes place. Well, duh, why is that happening? Yeah, the apostles aren't causing any turmoil. They're just preaching the gospel. It's the Jews that are stirring up the people and causing them. The Jews are turning the world upside down. The apostles aren't doing that, or Paul's not doing that. But their response to him. And what are they accusing him of? Verse 7. Oh, yes, he's speaking against Caesar. Of course, they can't, they can't convince Gentiles to be anti-Paul based on Jewish doctrine because the Gentiles don't believe any of that anyway, right? So they have to pick some political uh, reason that uh, would have some uh, bearing on the case. So anyway, they troubled the people the, the, uh, of the city and they had taken security of Jason and the others. They, they let them go and they accused Jace, poor Jason, who was a friendly Gentile, I guess. I'm not sure if he was a Jew or a Gentile, actually. Uh, in the city, had taken them in, and he had to post bond to, I guess, get them out of prison or keep them from being detained and to guarantee their safe passage. And so the brethren said, Paul, uh, it's probably best you get out of town <laughs> for a while. And so that brings us to our next segment here, verses 10 through 15. Any other thoughts on those first uh, nine verses. It's really sad that those who think they are fighting for God would turn to evil techniques uh, supposedly in defense of God. Exactly. Yeah, it's a good point. All right, uh, Ron, why don't you read 10 through 15 for us there? Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul and Maria, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to them with all speed, they departed. Okay. So they come down to the city of Berea, and how did the Bereans react differently from the Thessalonians when the gospel was preached? The Berean, Berean yeah, the Berean Jews uh, were more noble in that what? What made them more noble? Yes. Do, do we read of the Thessalonians opening the scriptures to see if this was so? No, they were closed-minded. They don't bother me with the facts. My mind's already made up type attitude, okay? But the Bereans actually were trying to confirm, let's see, this is, this is interesting. Let's see if what they're saying is we can really find this in the scriptures. And lo and behold, they obviously could. And many of them, as a result, responded uh, to the gospel. So here again, we have another case study of how people respond to the gospel message. Some people are closed-minded. They won't listen to, they won't even allow themselves to listen 
to the gospel message. Uh, they won't allow themselves to be convinced through facts, actually, that what is being said is true. On the other hand, you have other people who may not be sure of what they're hearing is true, but they are they go back to the source material that the one who's trying to convince them is citing, giving evidence of why they should believe what they believe. And so the Brians were much more fair-minded uh, than the Thessalonians in hearing the gospel, which is a message we need to understand today. If we try to present the gospel to someone. Some people, are go their minds are going to be closed. I don't want to hear that, you know. I know what I believe, and don't bother me with this stuff. Other people, it kind of piques their interest. Well, let, let me, I, I haven't understood it that way, but let me read that scripture you're talking about again and see. You know, they want to investigate and see if what you're saying is true. And so we have the similar response today to the gospel. Any thoughts on that, Gary? I think it's, uh, you know, the scriptures that they were searching, obviously, or what Paul had to say we would just call the Old Testament right. scriptures. And, and, uh, that's interesting because you could verify from the Old Testament that Paul was telling the truth. He preached the gospel from the Old Testament. And I think we, we need to do a better job today of being able to show people from the Old Testament that the gospel is true. Right. Plus Paul, I mean, they're checking what Paul would say to see if it's true. Paul, as an apostle, would have had the ability to perform miracles to confirm the truth of what he said. But even if somebody seems to be performing miracles, if what he says conflicts with what God has already known and revealed, it can't be true. Right. You know? Right. And so you, you have to check. I don't care who's speaking, they need to be willing to be checked by the scripture. Yeah, you'll notice in both of these instances, Paul's not demonstrating any supernatural powers that he could have. I mean, there's no evidence he performed any miracles in Thessalonica. There's no evidence he healed anybody in Berea. He's just preaching using the scriptures. So that just goes to show you that even in apostolic times, people could be convinced to receive the gospel message just by an honest reading of the scriptures and seeing how Jesus has fulfilled the things that are recorded there. No, no, he didn't object at all. Just, and so here are these Thessalonican Jews, they get wind that Paul's down there and they got to go down there and stir up trouble. And so he was sent away, mainly for safety's sake, down to Athens. And apparently Timothy and Silas remained behind in Berea, possibly strengthening the brethren and reinforcing that which Paul has taught. And Paul tells these folks who took him to Athens, get word back to Timothy and Silas. I'm going to wait here in Athens. I want them to come and join me here. Okay, so now we're at, to Athens, beginning at verse 16. Any uh, other thoughts on those verses? Let's next read verses 16 through 21. 16 through 21. Jeff, you want to read those for us? in the synagogues with the Jews and with God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present and some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers uh, as well were conversing with him. Some were saying, what could this scavenger of Tidbits want to say? Others, he seemed to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. Okay, saying, May we know what this new teaching is, and you are what you are which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. 
Okay, very good. How was that in verse 18? Um, some says, what will this, what did you say? Uh, they were Something about... Scavenger of now, who in the right mind would come up with that as a translation? Of the Greek there, a scavenger of tidbits. Seriously, what translation are you reading from? That's the New American Standard. Well, that's another reason I don't use the New American Standard. I mean, seriously, I mean that's the King James says. What would this babbler say? Doesn't that make more sense to you than a scavenger of tidbits? I don't know. What a, scav is that? Does that mean somebody's? Likes, likes to eat tidbits and they go out and try to scavenge and many of I mean, Gary? The Greek literally here is seed picker, one who picks seeds, which, which is a person who, you know, a lazy idler who, you know, eats what he eats by picking up scraps and doesn't have anything useful to say. And so you've got to find a way to translate seed picker. What, what does it mean? So. It has to do with the nonsense of what you're saying. Whatever. I like babbler better. But anyway, <laughs> I know what a babbler is. So anyway, okay, well, that's interesting. So, well, they were translating it almost literally then. Okay, well, I'll give them credit for that. It still didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but whatever. I thought, I don't think I'd ever heard that verse read like that before. Okay, so anyway, so he gets down to Athens, and he runs into a couple of different classes of folks. We're going to spend a little time on this. We have the Stoics and the Epicureans. So if you see someone today and that you say, well, he's a real Stoic individual, what do you mean by that? Someone who's Stoic could be as happy as can be or as sad as can be, and you would never know it by their outward actions, okay? So Stoics believe that virtue was the highest good in the, in the um, universe. Your life should be, should be a demonstration of virtue. You should live a virtuous life while on this earth. The Epicureans, on the other hand, were just the opposite. They believe pleasure was life's goal. It's your goal in life to be happy. And everything that is in this world is here to help you be happy. And you need to utilize these things for your happiness and for your good in moderation, of course, because excesses can cause uh, problems for individuals. But pleasure and self-satisfaction and so forth should be one's goal in life. Now, what did both the... Stoics and the Epicureans, well, I might be stretching that a little bit, share in common. What was the Greek's view of deity? all the altars they had erected and so forth there in Athens. So another way to kind of compare these groups from that standpoint is, since they're philosophers and they represent schools of philosophies, the Stoics believe that the material world is governed by a logos or a, a, a power of movement. Uh, if you will. Who would that be? We would say. Who governs the world? Who made the world? God. Okay. So God. So actually the Stoics believed in a force in nature. They didn't understand it as the one true God of heaven, but they're on the right track. I'll put it that way. All right. The Epicureans, on the other hand, thought
thought the gods were totally un, uninvolved in human affairs. You know, as Alan pointed out, there was a god for this and a god for that, and they had all these altars to all these gods. The Epicureans didn't buy any of that, but the Stoics did. The Stoics thought that there was a divine energetic substance that imposed order on the universe. Well, who would that be? God, okay. The Epicureans thought everything just happened by chance, random. There wasn't any organized force in the universe. Uh, the Stoics believed that logos or nature or God are, inter are interchangeable terms. Whereas, as we said, the Epicureans believed that the pursuit of pleasure was the greatest good in life. The Stoics believed in devotion to duty and morals to live in accordance with logos or that force of nature that governs each of us and we're to order our lives based on that rather than basing our lives on the fulfillment of pleasure as the Epicureans thought. So you've got these two groups of people that Paul meets up with that really, you think they ought to be arguing every day. <laughs> because they have nothing in common. They don't agree on anything. But one thing they do agree on is they like to do what? Learn something new every day. So there's a lesson we should take. Even people with divergent views or philosophies of life should have the desire to learn something new every day. I mean, you want to live your whole life closed-minded and never learn anything new? Well, there's some of us that would like to have not had to learn anything new. Or these babies here. <laughs> so, but anyway, life changes and there's something new to be learned all the time. And to give them credit, despite their warped view of creation, God, and all of that, they were interested in learning more. As opposed to those Jews back in Thessalonica in the synagogue who, where were their ears? They didn't want to learn anything new. They didn't even want to be reminded of anything old. <laughs> they didn't want to be reminded of the Old Testament scriptures and how Jesus had uh, fulfilled those things. So anyway, I just bring this up so we have a good understanding of the background of these folks that, Paul is going to be talking to and where they're coming from on this. And they said, he's, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. That was probably the Stoics uh, talking there. And so they wanted to take him up to the Areopagus, which was what? What was the Areopagus in Athens? Hmm? Mars Hill. What in our government would the Areopagus sort of be compared to? Alan should know this. The Supreme Court, yeah. The Areopagus was the Supreme Court of Athens. So any major issue that needed determination or judgment or something was, was the judgment took place there. So they invite him to come up to the Areopagus and present his case to the court. Because we read in verse 30 that Dionysius, the Areopagite, became a believer. Well, an Areopagite was one of the ju judges that was sitting on the court up there. So Paul actually convinced one of the Greek judges on Mars Hill of what he was saying about God was really true. So I thought that was pretty impressive. Okay, so let's read uh, verses 22 through the rest of the chapter. Anybody want to read all that or part of it? Susan, you want to read a few verses there? God created the world and everything in it, being born in heaven and earth, was not only the temple of the Nicaragua, nor is he served by human hands, but from the Jews. 
among us, for in him we live and we live and we live. It's even some spirit of God that said, for we have indeed this offspring. All right, stop right there. Okay. So Paul is now on, on Mars Hill and he's making his presentation. Is he preaching from the Old Testament scriptures? Well, <laughs> is he approaching these people of the as if they have knowledge of Jewish religion. I'll put it that way. No. What's he, what angle is he approaching them from? Their own religion. Absolutely. Isn't that interesting? Paul's approach to these people on Mars Hill is totally different than his approach to the people in Thessalonica, in Berea, because he's not going to have a bunch of Jews going up to the Areopagus, stirring up the people who run him out of town. At least, not yet. Not until he... Maybe some other problems develop down the road, but not, not here in Athens. He'll get, run, he'll get in trouble in Ephesus with the Greeks because the silversmiths are losing business because of his preaching against idols. But here in Athens, he's approaching them from their own religion, okay? And in their own religion, what did the Stoics say in their philosophy? There's this logos that's in a divine, energetic substance that imposes order, and that we're all products of this logos, okay? Well, if they're products of this Logos, then Paul is asking, what are all these altars and images I see lining your streets? Seriously? If you think you're coming from this living, moving, active force in the universe, I mean, seriously? You think this piece of wood is doing that? This rock? This altar? So he's showing them initially inconsistencies in their own thinking. Okay? They're confused in their thinking. They're thinking one way and then building shrines, temples, and images to re that represents, they're building inanimate objects to represent some animated force in the universe that they don't understand. And he's just showing their inconsistencies in that initially. Somebody say something. Right. That's where they're going to go. That's where you go to learn all new things. <laughs> it was the center of learning, and the Greek language is still the universal, even though Latin was maybe the spoken language. Greek was the language of the intellectuals. So, anyway. <clears throat> He says, I, you know, I, I walk through town, I see all these images. He says, this one that you've, re that you've labeled to the unknown God and you ignorantly worship, that's what I want to tell you about. <laughs> I don't want to talk about any of these other shrines that you've got developed, but I want to tell you about this one. And then he goes about doing what? What does he tell them that God has done? They're beginning in verse 24. Yeah, all this stuff that you're attributing to the Logos, that's what God has done. And he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He's not worshipped with men's hands. And he's made of one blood all nations that dwell on the face of the earth. He's, he's limited where they come and go and the bounds of their habitations and so forth. And he's also put in their minds that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from us. So he's actually sort of giving these philosophers a, a backdoor compliment in the, th in the sense that the God that you're talking about here, this Logos, he has put in every one of his creation that spark of curiosity about 
who or what he is. That's why you're a Stoic. You know, you're you're wanting to understand more about what this logos or this force in nature is. Well, actually, this God of heaven put that desire as part of your DNA. <laughs> and that's actually a compliment to both the, the Stoics and the Epicureans, their curiosity. Okay. And it says you could seek the Lord and maybe perhaps you could find him and though he not be far from us. He says, for in him we live, move, and have our being as even a certain of your own poets have said, for we are also of his offspring. And so the next thing I want to look at is the poet Aratus who lived from 310 to 240 B.C. He lived after Socrates, but was probably somewhat of a contemporary of Aristotle. And he was one of the more fa famous Greek poets of the third century. And an interesting thing is he was a native of Cilicia, and some people think he may have even been a native of Tarsus. So the Apostle Paul, being an educated Roman citizen of the city of Tarsus, probably has studied Aratus in his formative years. I don't know that Gamaliel would have taught him about Aratus, but he had, I'm sure, some secular education as well as religious education in Jerusalem. And so Paul was probably very familiar with, with the poem Phenomena, which is Aratus' most famous poem. And the quotation that Paul was probably referring to was this. Let us begin with Zeus, who we mortals never leave unspoken. For every street, every marketplace is full of God. Even the sea and the harbor are full of his deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to God, for we are indeed his offspring. And that's a direct quote from that poem. And Aratus uh, oftentimes uh, took the words of, philosophy, of current philosophy and set them to poetry. And this was one of them. And so when Paul says, you know, even your own poets are talking about the God I'm talking about, but you just haven't realized who he is. <laughs> That's why I'm telling you who he is today. And so we are his, his offspring, and in him we live, move, and have our being. Okay, let's read the rest of the chapter, and we'll wrap it up here. 29 through 34, who wants to read that? Martha Ann, you want to read that? Okay. Well, on that previous slide, one column we didn't talk about are the skeptics. <laughs> there were some of those around too. And so we have all we have all philosophies represented in this uh, little story of the of Paul's interaction with these philosophers in Athens. So in times past, people did what? They thought the Godhead was like to gold, silver, stone, graven by art, and man's device. So what's he talking about there? Idols. Idols. He's talking about idolatry. At one time, men tried to represent God with all these things. And how did God in times past consider that? They were doing that what? Yeah, they were in ignorance. They they didn't understand. They were their intentions were good, but not correct. 
okay? And so in times past, he referred to this as ignorance. God winked at or overlooked, but he now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he's appointed a day when he's going to judge the world. If he's going to judge the world, you need to know who God is. You're not going to be worshiping an idol or in a temple or something like that. You need to be worshiping your creator, you know, the one who made you and put that spark in your mind to seek after him and so forth and so on. And so when they heard about the resurrection, some mocked. That would be the skeptics, probably. And others said, well, we'll hear you again. And then some believed right on the spot, uh, uh, among which were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So many people who heard Paul speak that day accepted what he was saying. Others were still curious. We'd like, like to hear some more about this. And then others said, well, they just didn't believe him at all. Kind of similar to today, right? Some people have their minds and ears closed to, to the gospel message. Others are not fully convinced, but their interest is peaked enough that they'd like to hear more about it. And then the others are ready to receive it right now. And so here again, you have a, a, an audience of Greeks primarily hearing the gospel message, and here's how they reacted to it. What did they not do? To, to Paul. They didn't run him out of town. They didn't, they didn't stone him. They didn't threaten him. They didn't stir up the city of Athens to, against him that he was trying to overthrow Caesar. They were, they were intelligently listening to the gospel message and intelligently reacting to it. Some of their reactions were not right, but they were based on hearing the word unfiltered. So that's another lesson, I think, for us today as both hearers of the gospel as well as deliverers of the gospel. Uh, be aware of the type audience response you're apt to receive and why, and then how you should receive it uh, in the proper way. Okay, well, our time's up. Appreciate your participation. And who's got... We have singing Wednesday night, right? So we'll look at maybe the questions next Lord's Day.